As Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan began their attempted conquest of the world, the sleeping giant America sat back until awakened that dreadful December day. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. When the bombing of Pearl Harbor occurred on December 7, 1941, it was uh, Sunday afternoon here. Of course, prior to that, anybody who followed world events knew that Europe had already been embroiled in a war since 1939, since September of 1939. The Nazi juggernaut had been rolling through Europe in 1939, 1940. Uh, Britain had been engaged 1940 and 41. So when the bombing occurred, on um, Sunday morning in uh, Hawaii, but Sunday afternoon here when the word came, uh, I think the feeling was that, well, we're, we're in it now. Here in West Virginia, the news broke on one of the few radio stations, including CBS's interruption of the New York Philharmonic Symphony. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. The attack also was made on all naval and military activities on the principal island of Oahu. The whole country was shocked because it was a sneak attack, see, and the Japanese planes came in and, and it was on a Sunday morning and all the sailors were relaxed. When I was stationed in Fort Island in the middle of Pearl Harbor in 1945, I slept about 300 feet from the Arizona, which was on the bottom with 1,189 men still in it. And they pounded on the, the steel of the ship for a long time, trying to get people out, but they, there was too much devastation in, in December the 7th, 41, to, to get them out of the ship. They died there, and that's their grave right now, 1,189. I was, I was in high school. I remember it was a Sunday here. And I lived in a little town called Bethlehem, about a mile out. And uh, we, we were all together with the guys. And some of my neighbor's uh, sisters ran, ran up to us and says, you know, we're, we're in war uh, at Pearl Harbor. Now, I was good in geography, but Pearl Harbor didn't ring a string with me, you know. And then, of course, when we went up home at that time, uh, we just had radio. We didn't have TV. And... When I went in the house, I told Dad, I said, turn the radio on, I think we're in war with Japan. And of course, as a World War I veteran, he kind of shook his head, you know. And of course, for Mary, it was history. Well, I was already in service when Pearl Harbor occurred. <laughs> I hate to admit this, but on that weekend, I was AWOL. <laughs> because I was down in Mississippi, uh, outside Jackson. Uh, then came back on Sunday afternoon and got back in my uh, quarters. A mate uh, said to me, it was about five o'clock, said, I heard something strange on the radio. And I said, well, what'd you hear? And he said, the Japs have a, J Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor. And <laughs> I remember now, I said to him, well, where in the world's Pearl Harbor? I had no idea, and neither did he. But we found out pretty soon because two hours later, all our officers showed up and we had a formation that night and got ready to go after the Japanese. Most West Virginians were working class citizens uh, trying to make a living. West Virginia suffered tremendously during the Great Depression. There had been a turn down after World War I in coal production. A lot of miners were out of work or they were underemployed, they may be working part-time. With my wife and all that, we were going through depression and a lot of layoffs at the mines. So then I was drafted and uh, I had to report uh, to uh, Cincinnati. And there from there, I was uh, attached to the 10th Armored Division, make a nice cowry. When I was 17, I was drafted, and they had, had all of us lined up, and we were just numbers, and 
Some of them in front of me went in the Army and they said they needed three in the Navy, so the next three, which I was one of the three, put us in the U.S. Navy. And, they, and I had 159 men in the company that, where I took my boot training. Our full engagement in the war really wouldn't come until um, later in 1942, the Battle of Midway, which was the first significant victory in the Pacific Theater. But we actually didn't, didn't fully mobilize for months after that, um, 1943, 1944. Aerial bombardment and the air war had been going on since, since the war began, 1939. And when the U.S. got into the fight in, after Pearl Harbor, over time, we increased bombing raids into Germany, and one particularly important raid occurred in late 1943, in October of 43. Allied intelligence had tried to determine what would be a, a strategic target to hit to try and slow down Germany's war production. Um, and what was chosen as a target was a ball bearing works or ball bearing factory and while a ball bearing may not seem that important in the overall scheme of uh, the German war machine, so much of the German fighting capability depended on the lowly ball bearing, from airplanes to tanks to uh, other pieces of moving equipment and machinery, ball bearings are a key element. Two years after Pearl Harbor, America's Air Corps launched its biggest mission. 379 aircraft flew over Germany lines unescorted. The mission? To cripple Germany's war manufacturing in Schweinfurt. By the time I went to Schweinfurt, I was a captain. I was the pilot of a lead crew in my squadron. This was the first Schweinfurt mission. In, and I led my squadron, and we were the high squadron in the high group, which was the safest place you could be facing German fighters because they never shot at the top group, they shot at the, at the lead group and the low group, principally the low group because they came in from the front and shooting 20 millimeters, which at, at a certain point, they'd roll the airplane over on the back and go straight down. We had 50 cal calibers and they could stay out of our range as they were shooting at us. So they because they had to turn over and come, go down and go right in front of the lower, whoever was below, uh, they just fired at the low group all the time. And the high, high people had almost a free ride. I went to Schweinfurt and back without a scratch. Had no problem at all. Under heavy fire from the Germans, the bombers missed their targets. They knew that they would have to face death again and crossed the German lines for another raid. This time, Germany was ready for revenge. And in 1943, um, we had no troops on the ground in Germany, so this raid would have taken place um, once the troops crossed the English Channel, would have been completely on German-occupied, Nazi-occupied uh, territory. The second time around, well, we knew we were gonna go back because we missed the target on the first round. Everybody did. We didn't do any da enough damage to make any difference. So we knew we'd going back, and of course the Germans knew we would be coming back too. So on the October raid, by chance, it was my turn to lead my squadron, and my squadron was going to lead our group, uh, and we were going to lead the whole Eighth Air Force. It was our turn to. Every, all these things came in rotation. So it was our turn to lead the 8th Air Force. Uh, so we formed up and started back. Well, our low squadron, the uh, 305th, I believe it was, failed to join up with us. And uh, here we were getting ready to depart the British coast in formation with only two groups in our wing. And all the other wings had three groups in them. Well, that made us the target for the Germans right off. There was less people shooting at them uh, with only two groups. So they just riddled us is what happened. They concentrated on us. 
and I've forgotten now how many airplanes we made to the target, but we lost airplanes all along the route, right and left. After suffering massive casualties, the Allied bombers hit their targets, demolishing the German war factories. The treacherous 500-mile journey back to Allied territory begins. I, I remember our, my right wingman, a boy from South Dakota, the pilot, and uh, he, he, he was the deputy leader, and he got, he got shot up right on my right wing and had to go down, called up and bid us goodbye and wished us good luck and <laughs> bailed out of his airplane. It was on fire. We lost uh, the fellow behind us, got shot down, and well, we lost, we lost about half our airplanes on the way in. And after bombing and turning for home, and we came home on the southern route, we lost some more. I got back to my base with, with five airplanes out of 21. So that gives you an idea of what happened to us. We had a couple that landed on the shore of England, didn't try to make it back to the base because they had uh, either engines out or wounded people who needed immediate attention. So it was a long, rough day, I'll tell you that. And we were very lucky to have made it. But luck was with us. For over a year, General McLaughlin and the Air Corps focused on achieving air superiority by decimating the German Air Force, setting the stage for the Allied invasion of Europe in 1944, now known as June of 1944 is the, the most famous invasion of France, invasion of Normandy, where our troops figured significantly in that fight. The invasion of Normandy was, and still is, the largest amphibious assault ever launched in human history. A total of about 160,000 troops were ferried across the English Channel. Um, and prior to the actual amphibious invasion, the morning of June 6th, the night of June 5, June 6th, uh, paratroopers were dropped into France um, in advance of the assault. The role that the actual naval craft played in D-Day cannot be um, overstated. One of, the, one of the key vessels that ferried troops and supplies to Normandy would be the LST. LST, which stands for Landing Ship Tank, was um, a very large vessel, roughly the size of a football field, about 347 feet long. So that's a football field plus both end zones and a little bit more. The LST that I was on was built in Jeffersonville, Indiana. And we boarded the ship and went down the Mississippi River. And we tied up at night because we couldn't travel on that that river at night is too dangerous into the Gulf of Mexico and around Florida and up the East Coast and then moved over to England and uh, then we went up a river which was bigger than the Elk River and they had us lined up up this river ready to move whenever they declared the invasion and when it came time we all moved out into the bay and we headed across the English Channel and there were ships as far as you could see. Before we arrived at France, they were bombing France for, in anticipation of the army landing. And the planes were in the air as far as you could see in every direction, left, right, front, back. By 1944, Hitler had recalled his remaining aircraft to protect the motherland. As Allied ground forces began their descent on Europe, they deployed over 3,000 bomber and fighter aircraft over France to ensure protection from the skies. All the ships, landing ships, moved out. And uh, when we arrived in France off the coast, we had to send the troops in by small boat. We couldn't get to the beach. There was too many of these steel obstacles that looked like a jumping jack, except they're six or seven feet tall, and a ship couldn't move in among those. It'd tear the bottom out. These massive Troop carriers and supply ships could carry tanks, they could carry jeeps, they could carry troops, 
and when they brought them across the English Channel under enemy fire on D-Day, they would deposit them on the beach, um, which would go a long way toward helping secure the beachhead. My job on the LST, my job when we were underway was in the engine room where they made the electric power. But my job when we had general quarters, which means everybody go to a battle station, I was gun captain on a 40 millimeter that was on the right side of the ship up in the bow. I saw the, the whole beach of Omaha from, from one end to the other all that morning and all that day when the ch troops were going ashore. And we, we, of course, didn't go ashore, but we laid off. And I saw the destroyers move in and, and pound those. That cliff was on the left side of our landing. And on the beach, there's only one road for them to get off of the beach and up into France. And it was just bumper to bumper of trucks and tanks leaving there. But uh, it, it was very interesting. And I knew that it was a, a memorial thing that I would remember. And I, I made sure that I saw it all. We were looking at the boats that were burned and we were on one boat and I said, there's a guy, a dead guy right there. And the other guy said, where? I said, well, look, there's his teeth and his head. He was burned from a shell that hit his boat and burned him. And of course, we saw the men dying and floating past our ship. And I remember one man, he had red hair and he had a life jacket, but he was hanging in the water like this and that red hair was floating out. So it was terrible to see some of them, what they went through. Um, LSTs continued to ferry troops and supplies to Normandy beyond um, June 6th. And um, after bringing troops and supplies into the fight, they also would turn around and bring casualties and German POWs back across the channel back to uh, England. Then after we unloaded our troops, we went back to England and we made 15 trips from England to France. In the first seven trips, we brought back wounded soldiers. And then after the seventh trip, we started bringing back German prisoners to England. The German prisoners that we had were 14-year-old, 15-year-old boys. They were young men that were childs, really, but the Germans older soldiers, we had pretty much annihilated them. Uh, I will say this, during the invasion of Normandy, there was no German airplanes. The third day we were there, one flew over and every ship opened up on that plane and shot it down. And they bought the German pilot aboard our ship because we were a flagship, which means that the Admiral in control of the whole fleet stayed on our ship. And the next morning they took him off of the ship to a hospital. So never knew what happened to him. We were there for three months and uh, later on when the troops moved farther into France we were allowed to go ashore. That We went about five miles inland into France and we, five of my buddies, and then we saw a tank burn in a field and we decided we'd go on far enough. After Germany suffered a crushing defeat on D-Day, the Allies steamrolled through Europe until the Nazi war machine braced themselves for a final stand at the Battle of the Bulge. Optimistic estimates predicted that the war could be over in Europe by Christmas of 1944. And um, until December of 1944, there was still some hope that Germany was about to crumble and that resistance would end and the Allies could, in fact, um, get to Berlin and end the war pretty quickly. However, uh, in mid-December, December 17th, the Nazis launched a counteroffensive called the what we know as the Battle of the Bulge today. That counteroffensive was launched through the Ardennes Forest of Belgium, and it created about a 50-mile bulge in the Allied front. Um, that, that engagement, known as the Battle of the Bulge, raged for about a month December and early January in one of the coldest winters that Europe had seen in decades. We pulled out uh, early part of September to go to Europe. And we were the first armored division. We landed in Cherbourg, France. 
and the, the front wasn't too far away from there. And then from there, we started, I remember our captain that night says, and tomorrow you will meet the enemy. And for me, an old coal miner, both, you know, old private at the time, really went through me. So we had our first battle. And then from there, we kept moving. And then finally, we got a, a straight from uh, General Patton to our general. He says, bring the 10th Armored right now. We was wondering what the heck's going on. So we went there, and then we found out it was the big push from the Germans. And they call it the barge because they, they hit us this way. We were the first unit ever in Bastogne at that time. Uh, the fighting was fierce. The resistance was fierce because the Nazis threw into the fight some of their elite troops, SS troops and forces that um, would fight to the last. Uh, ultimately, the battle for Bastogne was of critical importance. Bastogne was a crossroads town. A lot of roads led to Bastogne. Bastogne was the point of, of kind of a last ditch effort to stop the, the German assault. And it was, it was a successful defense of Bastogne. Um, against all odds, Allied troops, U.S. forces, including um, infantry as well as um, tanks, stemmed the tide of the bulge at Bastogne. Our air support could not help them. Uh, the weather was just, it was just, you couldn't, couldn't find a place. We couldn't get in to, to help our troops. Up to that point at Caen and all the other places, after the invasion in June, the 6th of June uh, of 44, every time the army would be confronted by the Germans in any sizable numbers, we'd come in and just massacre the German troops. I mean, we'd give them 24 hours of steady bombing, wouldn't be anything left out there, and then our army could march on. And that happened two or three times uh, until the Battle of the Bullets and then we could get in. Between fierce fighting with elite Axis forces and the blistering cold, the Allies were forced to hold for days under dire conditions until the weather broke and reinforcements and air support helped recapture the initiative for our troops. Every day I briefed a, a new mission in there. Uh, so after six days of that, I was up all night, every night, uh, getting these uh, briefings ready. And uh, after six days of it, I was dead on my feet, tired. So it was my turn to lead, and, <laughs> and the weather was breaking so we could get in. And uh, we had a little target, a crossroads. It was our target. It was an easy mission, a nothing mission for us. So we went in, I think, at 15,000. We'd go up to 25. And when I got in the airplane, I was so dead tired and got formed up. I said to the navigator, I said, boys, I'm going to lean back and take a nap. Call me when we get to the initial point. That's where you start your bomb run. Well, <laughs> I was about half asleep. <laughs> it's hard to imagine going on a bomb, <laughs> an attack, and me half asleep in the cockpit. But I was. Well, all of a sudden we get hit in the airplane rolls through the air, back and forth, and shrapnel rolls down the outside, cracking and making a lot of noise. And I come to, and I said, what in the hell's going on? Who's shooting at us? Well, sir, there's three tanks down here, all shooting at us. And I looked out the window, and sure enough, I could see one of them. There was, the ground was covered with snow, so it was easy to pick them out. And they were down there shooting at us. Well, they didn't do any real damage, so we went on to our target and dropped our bombs and went home. And when, after we'd landed and got on the ground and everything, I got up out of my seat to get out of the airplane, and something went clank, clank, clank. And I turned around and looked down. A piece of shrapnel, half as big as my fist, or, or maybe uh, more than that, had come clear through the airplane and up through the metal seat and hit me in the rear, but never broke the skin. 
and I was half asleep and didn't realize it. It was a real nothing mission for us, but it sure we sure were able to get, let the army get get going again. The enemy had lost one hundred thousand soldiers. The Americans with their allies, 54,000. So you can see what a battle that was. And especially it was winter, and it's a good thing they gave us our shots because you're out in the cold and all that. The Nazi war machine was beaten to submission at the Bulge. It soon became clear the war in Europe was all but won by the Allies. The day coming became known as Victory in Europe Day. I finally got permission to come home. Uh, in March of 45, and I grabbed it. I've been gone for over two years. I flew my last mission in February, but I knew the war was over right then. You know, you could tell. The armies were moving on. We, we supported Patton during that winter. Oh, yeah, you know, the word went through there like caught far. He said, boy, the war was over. You're in that line. And, of course, there was the story about uh, Hitler with all that in Berlin, you know. Somebody says, hey, that's our relief. I said, I don't care if it was all women. I said, well, I want to go home, you know. Victory in Europe Day or VE Day, while it was greeted with enthusiasm here, uh, most people realized that the, the war was not over. There was still a job to do to force Japan to surrender. After victory was declared in Europe, the Allies focused on the defeat of Imperial Japan. Even after suffering massive defeats all over the Pacific theater, the Empire of Japan finally surrendered after the U.S. brought their reign of terror to an end with the first two atomic bombs the world have ever seen. On the night that we got the VJ, the Japan surrendered, everything that could move, we made a parade around the, air, uh, the airfield. And the airfield, you, don't, you never walked across the airfield where the plane fled, but we had a paved road all the way around and we had everything that would move and, and they let us do what we wanted to. We were all so excited. We were blowing the horns and had the lights on. When the war in Japan ends, VJ Day as it's called, uh, we actually celebrate or commemorate two days here in the U.S. Uh, August 14th is the day when Japan stopped fighting. The official surrender, which took place aboard the USS Missouri at Tokyo Bay, occurred on September 2nd, 1945. And either of those days, if you were anywhere in the U.S., you would have celebrated because essentially that meant the war was over. This is a story of just three of the nearly quarter million West Virginians who answered the call of duty in World War II. And will be forever known as the greatest generation.